Today, you're very lucky to have uh, Mark Fontana uh, um, telling you about uh, some of the computing issues that come up um, in general in empirical research, but that are particularly important when dealing with the, the big data sets and the computational requirements of doing social science genomics. Um, so those of you who have interacted with Mark over the last couple of weeks uh, probably realize he's, he's become really an expert in the methods, the, the computational methods uh, for doing this kind of work. He's, the, he's become the go-to guy for the SSGAC and not to mention a lot of our collaborators who are constantly uh, asking Mark for advice. Um, he, uh, he and I actually go back uh, a long ways. He was an undergrad at Cornell uh, when I was a, a professor there. Um, finishing his degree in economics and, and government. Um, then he stayed at Cornell for another year to do a master's in operations research with a computerish kind of focus, uh, and then went to Michigan for a PhD, and now he's doing a postdoc um, uh, with me and David and uh, at the Behavioral and Health Genomics Center at USC. Um, so here's Mark. Thank you, Dan. Um, so the outline, sort of what I'd like to cover today, this is going to be a much less structured uh, set of presentations and sessions than some of the prior ones. Um, I'm going to spend probably the majority of this first time slot um, going through a paper that I put down on the reading list, uh, Code and Data for the Social Sciences, a Practitioner's Guide by Genskow and Shapiro, going order sort of uh, best practices and other things you might want to keep in mind while doing uh, social science research. Um, but we're going to take a point to point out exactly where maybe some of these suggestions aren't quite the best for genomics research because of sort of the nature of the large data and other facets of that. Uh, I'm then going to have sort of a short conversation about parallelization and how we can sort of leverage the computing resources we have to make analyses go much faster. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about things we didn't consider in problem set five. Uh, I see a lot of you have kind of been asking me questions about it, so it's good people are starting to go through it. Obviously that is not uh, completely extensive of all the sorts of things one might consider in these analyses, so we can talk about that. Um, I'll then open up the floor for questions and, and we can discuss problem set five or any other kind of broad questions you have. But I'd like a majority of the time to be spent with you guys taking advantage of the fact that you have this data set in front of you, not only to finish problem set five, but to go and start of explore your own interests, um, to look through the code book, find what inspires you, um, get your hands dirty trying to do some of those analyses. And I'll kind of circle the room during this process and hopefully we can all kind of help each other and this will be sort of an interactive experience and then we can kind of go over more questions and, and iterate. Um, so to get started, um, on the Genskow Shapiro bit of this. Um, this quote uh, spoke to me quite a bit when I first read it. So for many of us, most of the time, what it means is research that is writing and debugging code. We write code to clean data, to transform it, to scrape it, to merge it. We write code to execute statistical analyses, to s simulate models, to format results, to produce plots. We stare at puzzle over fight with and curse at code that isn't working the way we expect it to. We dig through old code when we try to figure out what we were thinking and we wrote it or why we're getting a different result that we got the week before. Um, this summarized my life in a lot of very, in a very cogent way. Um, so I figured this is a good kind of starting point in, in thinking through a lot of these issues. Um, the problem that we kind of seek to address and this paper seeks to address is sort of meta research methodology. What are best practices of organizing the computational methods and analyses that go into this sort of research? Um, the problem is that sort of the seat of the pants approach that is often employed, that I often observe in seeing research done, definitely has its limits. And the reality is that computer scientists and others have kind of found much better ways to do this and rules of thumb that should we follow um, leads to sort of more thorough, careful uh, research that we can track and make sure is not making silly errors, et cetera. Um, so, but obviously this was written for sort of a pure social science research agenda in mind. So we really need to keep in touch or with the fact, as I mentioned, that some of these things aren't going to be really relevant to genomics research. Um, some of them won't even be completely feasible for genomics research. Uh, 
Um, we're also really not often in the business of developing software. I think some of the advice is better suited to uh, perhaps people who are purely developing methodology where there's software associated with that. Um, and the root of, I think, of a lot of the lack of feasibility of some of their suggestions is the fact that there are bottleneck processes that we face when doing genomics research. So running a GWAS, for example, can be a time-consuming exercise and we wouldn't necessarily want to rerun it every time we want uh, to, to do some small bit of analysis. Um, the first major topic that they discuss in this paper and that I'd like to talk about is automation. Now this might come as sort of obvious in some sense, but we want to really automate everything that can be automated. Um, I know this is something I faced with um, research assistants and others that it's very easy to sort of run analysis the first time, not really write down what you did, and then sort of copy and paste your results. Um, it, it seems obvious probably why this is a really poor approach, um, but especially in sort of creating output, copying and pasting will yield transcription errors. Um, it's really best to write a single script that executes all code, if possible, from beginning to end. Now, as I said, this doesn't really necessarily apply to the whole research pipeline in a genomics project. Um, there are very few instances where we want to rerun everything that's been done. Now, we faced this at educational attainment a couple of times where a cohort pulled out and we had to sort of rerun the entire pipeline. Um, but for the most part, it's not the case that you'll want to rerun everything. Um, like I said, there are bottleneck processes. So for example, a GWAS, uh, if, if I've calculated it takes a day, we don't want to wait a day every time we want to rerun something upstream or downstream. Um, so we want to automate before and after these sort of bottlenecks that we've identified. Um, I personally like babysitting a lot of these processes, so I won't even necessarily write a bash script that does everything. Um, I'll have a readme file that has everything I've executed, sort of like a, a, a story, and I'll execute command by command and check output intermittently throughout the way. And that way I know if anything is awry, I know exactly where it's awry um, and what happens. Um, so automating between long tasks, I think, is sort of the, the key here. Um, and keeping track really of, of sort of a roadmap of exactly what was ran and what order um, the input and output files associated with it um, as a readme file such that imagine if the worst thing happened and you were, you were gone for some reason and, and your collaborators couldn't get a hold of you or whatever, that they had some resource by which they could figure out precisely what had been done. Um, and I think actually a lot of the subsequent points, not even just about automation, speak to that uh, issue. Um, so for example, the, they go through sort of a, a bunch of, in this paper, specific, specific examples of, you know, here's sort of badly formatted data that hasn't been automated. And then, you know, they, they say, okay, well, if we automated it, we could, we could do something like this where it's a, a, a sequence of commands that it's very clear what is ran in what order um, and, and exactly what we expect. Um, <coughs> Now, the, you know, the, this is a, a little kind of toy example, but I mean, I, I just look at this and if, imagine in, uh, encountering a folder that had this in it um, as opposed to a folder that had a file that had this in it as well. Um, it's very clear what was done. Uh, the, the next big issue that they discuss is, is version control. And so the notion that, I, I'm sure people have encountered this before, that you're, you're collaborating with people you have a, a, some shared file that you're working on, and so you work on it, and so you edit the file, and then you add your initials and the date, and you upload it to some shared Dropbox folder or, or email it out or something like that. Um, this date and author method is a pain, um, potentially confusing. Um, now we have all sort of different files floating around. Um, sometimes just listening to the date is fine, especially I think when it's connected to some sort of submission event to a journal or some sort of specific important date, but for the most part, um, managing files like this I think is bad practice. Um, instead, it's, it's much wiser to have some centralized repository um, that you check code into and out of that automatically records the versioning for you. It keeps track of exactly who edited what and when and keeps track of what the files look like at every step along the way. Um, now this is a bit more specific perhaps to software development um, using uh, Git or Bitbucket or something like that to do this. Um, 
we've found personally that, that Dropbox does a pretty good job of version control um, such that you're not renaming files by this date and author method. You allow Dropbox to overwrite, you know, you, you, you load up your new file, it overwrites, but then it's keeping track in the background for you of these, these various versions. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, good point. Um, I haven't used, I, I haven't tried using Google Docs for this. Um, they might, I think they suggested in the, the paper, so I can't specifically speak to that. But I, I tend to think, I, I guess by show of hands, how many of you used like Bitbucket or GitHub or one of these sort of management tools? Okay, so you know, something like half of you. I tend to think that it's better for pure software development than necessarily for project-based work. Um, so I, I don't quite share Genskow Shapiro's pension for it, for our kind of research. Um, but I think their point that uh, you know, date and authoring everything is, is pretty, can be bad practice. Um, they, they also insist that you should run sort of the whole directory before checking in and out. And I think this speaks to the point that I was just making, that there are certain bottleneck processes that we don't really want to be running everything every time. You know, if the whole set of analyses takes a minute, then maybe that's fine. But if it takes a day, this is obviously not doable. Um, so again, they, they provide sort of a, an example of a set of files that have been, you know, uh, indexed by date. Um, they've been indexed by some initials. Some of them have initials, some of them don't. Um, it's not particularly clear what regressions.log is, which one it refers to. Um, it's a bit confusing. Who knows if these things were updated and, and kept track of in the, the way that they're actually named. We have one that's, you know, 02-21-13-A versus one that doesn't have an A. Um, which one came first isn't totally clear either. Um, whereas if you didn't do that, you have something that's a bit more parsimonious. It's pretty clear what each one of these did. And whatever system this was put on was keeping track of the order and who saved what and when, and all the, the revisions that were made to them. It seems obvious, but I, I've seen this so many times that I think it bears kind of saying out loud. Um, perhaps I, I think this point is actually the most important one in this slide deck, and that is the organization of directories. Um, the advice that Genskow Shapiro offers, and one that I've started to take extremely seriously, is separating directories by function. Um, so personally, I always separate them into input, output, code, and intermediate folders. Um, it's amazing how much this simplifies when someone who didn't run the analyses comes in and wants to look at them exactly what was done. It's quite intuitive, I think. Um, this also adds to the issue, I think, of portability. Um, if everyone's maintaining a similar functional based directory structure, um, it's easy to take analyses that were run on one system and transport them to another. In order to make that feasible, it's the case that the first line of code should just set the local directory and everything else should basically run based on that first line. Um, so nothing else in the script should really be, need to be changed. It's the stuff at the top that defines <coughs> what it needs to set to make it run on the local file structure. Yeah. So I've done very similar things, but I've found it difficult because, so I guess you kind of said it with the last sentence, right? It, that you have to have the same local file uh, directory structure mm -hmm. wherever you put that file, right? So if they use the capital letter for data instead of a lowercase letter, like that will have to be changed in the code yep. or more appropriately just change the directory name, right? Right. But you have to have identical directory structures. Yes. Um, and so is there any way that you found or heard of to help maintain either identical directory structures or to incorporate flexible directory structures when making your code portable? I think, uh, well, there are kind of two ways to address this. I mean, one, there's one issue that sort of, I think, sidesteps the entirety of it. Um, and that is if you're all accessing the same server, this sort of sidesteps a lot of it. And I actually find that this, this 
can be the best way to address this issue. Now, that's not always feasible, right? It's not always the case that that's possible. Um, in the issue of saying like capital letters or someone has a slightly different name for the folder and things like that, I mean, it's still the case that the beginning of one's code, instead of defining, oh, look, this is the, the local directory all of this lives in, one could define all of those subfolders, um, which, which is a bit more confusing than you probably want it to be. But uh, it seems that the way to address this is to be very, I think, upfront at the beginning when you're starting analyses and to share that structure. Um, I'll admit this is not something we're always the best at because it's often the case that you're adding analyses as you go along and so that your structure changes and things like that. Um, but keeping, I think, sort of a, uh, a paradigm, a prototype of input, output, code, intermediary in every folder assigned to a specific analysis or function is general enough that it, that it takes away a lot of sort of the fixed costs of doing this rearranging. Um, yeah, Lucas? Oh, are there any, any specific suggestions in terms of file naming besides the, the one that we've already given us? Like, uh, so do not use initials, do not use version or dates, but like, yeah. any other suggestions? It's a good question. Um, rules of thumb, I, I try, and I, I probably break these rules myself sometimes, but um, I try to do all lowercase letters I try not to use dashes. I use entirely underscores. Um, again, spaces. say that again. No oh, spaces. certainly no spaces. Yes, yeah, spaces will will be the death of all of us. Um, function functional based <coughs> is is another. I think even good rule of thumb for files though that can be somewhat difficult. Um, like I mean, for example, uh, in this last slide, they have regressions dot do and regressions dot log, and so I, I'm, I mean, I don't know what that means. That's not quite specific. Maybe in the in, in the context of this analysis, it was very you know obvious. This seems like a very simple thing. Um, I think probably more important than any particular set of rules is to just be consistent internally um, with how you're naming things. Um, and, and that goes a long way. So if you're, if you're using, like, for example, underscores between words, stick to doing that in all of the files. Um, yeah? In general, I think in the remote server, how do you set the get system back or like the script backup? What do you mean? Can you say more? Um, there are, well, okay, so there are a couple issues here. One, there's the case of security that it's, it's, for example, if you have genomic data on our NBR server, we can't have that version controlled in a robust way because of the sensitivity of the data, right? Um, and, and I'm even extremely hesitant to look in a subfolder and to try to start version controlling that. What I personally do is copy my code folder onto my local directory and explicitly upload that to say my version control Dropbox. Um, so it, you have to do it, there's a little bit of manual work there, but if you've taken care to kind of organize directories into you know, code, input, output, intermediaries, um, the code folder doesn't contain anything sort of sensitive in it. Um, and, and it's everything you would need to sort of reconstruct what you've done. Um, so I. There's a the practical problem of security, but um, copying that, that folder is usually sufficient. But there is always the risk that like, you, for some reason, forget to update the folder, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and that, I think that, uh, that's a matter of just being well-disciplined, um, which can be difficult. I mean, I'm not saying I literally copy my code folder every single time I run an analysis because <coughs> I'd be spending all my time copying that folder back and forth but I do it once every couple of days. Um, I also, I mean, the reality too is that most servers will maintain backups. I mean, this is something server admins, and uh, this is not my expertise in some sense, but um, the server will be backed up. And so if anything were to be lost, the, the, your server admin should be able to recover things for you. Now that's not quite the same thing as version control. But there, there is um, that fallback. <laughs>
which I haven't had to ever use, but it's good to know it's there. Now, let's see, did we talk about... So I think this was mainly the points I wanted to make on this slide, but yeah, I mean, so underscores the point yet. Yeah, it eases debugging, it makes accessibility across projects much easier. Um, so an example here, you know, similar with their TV and potato example, they keep going with this. We have a bunch of files, it's not really clear which ones were created, which ones are ones that were uploaded and were input files, um, what anything means, maybe some of the other suggestions were implemented, but, but not this, this sort of this structure that looks a lot nicer when we have, it's very clear what the input files are because they're in the input folder. Um, and the, it's very clear what was ran as code, uh, what, was, what were the output files from that, you know, perhaps cleaning procedure. Um, and then I, I find actually the most helpful thing is, is dumping everything into this temp folder, all these little intermediate files that you really have no need to ever really dig into unless you're doing some kind of intense debugging. Um, but, uh, but here it's very explicit what those files are that, that are sort of in some sense less important. <coughs> um, so I should say as like a personal note, before I read this article, I had been pretty good with delineating function specific folders in terms of organizing our, our UKB analyses, um, saying, okay, look, this is one set of analyses, everything for that analysis is going in this folder. I was quite bad at within those folders organizing them like this. Um, and I think David can attest to that fact a little bit. Um, but uh, <laughs> but um, after reading this, it, it, I think it helped quite a bit in terms of organization. So now within these folders, it's very clear what was an input, an output, et cetera. Um, and so just, just to be clear, I mean, you, know, you guys know this by now on, on the server you have access to uh, right now, um, things weren't organized maybe the, the optimal way that I would have liked, um, but there's, there's a data directory. It's very clear what's in that data directory delineated by, by data set or function, and then you have your own you know, space to work with. Um, the next major point that they go through is, is one of keys, um, specifically sort of in terms of database structure. Um, I find that, that this point uh, is, is almost a bit superfluous for much of the genomics research we do because the data that we receive is in a format that these considerations have been taken into account very much upstream from when we receive the data. Um, so, I mean, what, the, what they're trying to underscore here is that we want to store data in clean tables with unique non-missing keys that's set up in a rational sort of relational database structure. The links between tables are explicit um, and data is, is kept normalized to the extent that's possible. Um, but with genetics, we're, the files are either indexed by individual or SNP, so this, this key concept is sort of implicitly taken into account already. Um, where this gets more important is that if we really want to manipulate the data that we receive for some extreme parallelization, maintaining a relational database that, that does that um, involves some more heavy lifting, but I find that it's, it's kind of nice, actually, the nature of the data is that this is often taken care of for us in the form that we receive it. Um, So the example that they provide is, is imagine you have this uh, bit of data and so it lists sort of the county and the state and the county population and the state population and there's some regional identifier um, stored this way. There's some missing data. It's, it's not really exactly clear what the lines with missing data correspond to. Um, but if we take into account, uh, sorry, if we uh, take seriously the notions of storing these in normalized tables, we would store them in something that looks more akin to this, um, where it's clear that for each um, state that corresponds in the, the left set to a particular row in the right set, um, and there's not ambiguity now about what everything means. It's a silly example, but it underscores the point. <coughs> 
Um, one of the other, the next sort of major topic that they go over in this paper is one of abstraction. Um, th this point is also, I think, a bit obvious in some sense, but maybe that's one of those things that then bears saying out loud. Um, we want to abstract away and make um, function-based code where possible. If you're finding yourself repeating code over and over again, it probably makes sense for you to create some function or script that does it in an abstract sense. Um, so the example they give is imagine you're performing some very similar analysis for the state, county, and, and metro level. You wouldn't want to write sort of three sets of identical code like this. Um, this is state of code. Um, you would instead want to create a function that does the lifting for you. Um, I found this point to be pretty obvious and something probably we're all pretty familiar with, but um, it bears saying out loud. Um, there are points about documentation I don't quite see totally eye to eye with. Um, they, they insist that you should not write documentation that you won't maintain. Now, I agree with part of that, that like, certainly you don't want to not maintain documentation. Um, but, and then that too much can be a bad thing. Um, but I think it's the, the more important guiding principle is that your code should be readable to anyone, especially people that aren't you. Um, should anything, you be gone, be on vacation, suddenly leave. People need to be able to know exactly what you did and be able to recreate it. And so code should be self-documenting to the extent that possible. But to the extent that it's not, um, I, I tend to think that there's not downside to more documentation as long as it's not um, confusing. The, the goal should be clarity, not length, I think. And so they, they provide an example where their documentation for calculating some elasticity doesn't really match what's in the code. And so this is where confusion can uh, bleed in a bit. Um, I think this just underscores that one would want to maintain this or set up this code in a way that this problem didn't exist. Um, instead, do something like this, where the the input of that one parameter, that three down there, uh, is made explicit by by local variables, slightly upstream in the code. The uh, I think this is one of the last issues they discuss is uh, task management. Um, that you really need to manage tasks and the workflow of the project with a task management system. And they underscore the point very strongly that email is not a task management system. Now, you guys haven't been working with Dan for as long as I have, but I beg to differ because he is excellent at task management over email. But it's still, I tend to agree with their point that it's not the, the best way of going about it. I think, though, with research projects um, of our nature, um, if we were writing software, I would certainly be on board with the full suggestion of using Bitbucket to assign tasks or Asana. Um, I think diligent researchers can manage this themselves. Um, what we've kind of settled on is, I think, a good uh, middle ground between some of these extremes is using Slack for projects. Um, I love Slack. How many people have used Slack in this room? Did, do you not like it, Robbie? No, I love it. Oh, OK, yeah, I thought your expression was one I thought of disgust over Slack, and I was. Um, like, super impressed Yeah, no, it's wonderful. So the thing I like about Slack, for those of you who haven't used it, it's essentially a bunch of chat windows, and you can create channels. Um, and and it, it keeps track of all your conversations, and everything is searchable, and you can upload files to it. Um, I think that it actually propels conversation in a way that email does not. Um, I would receive an email maybe at 10 p.m. and not really want to respond to it or, or something. Whereas if I get it in Slack, there's something more familiar and colloquial about the whole thing. And I'm, I find myself much more willing to respond to people and maintain conversation about topics over Slack. Um, 
it keeps, it therefore, I mean, by virtue, keeps track of the conversation. So you could always go back and query it. And you're not, you're not going through dozens of emails that you saved in some Gmail folder. Um, and so when things are written down that are to be done, um, for example, in our risk project, uh, Jonathan always posts meeting summaries, which have very specific who does what. And we can go back and look exactly who is assigned what. And so there's a, it's a bit of an intermediary between sort of the extreme of using Bitbucket or Asana or one of these and just using email to organize all of your project-based work. Um, so I, I really like Slack. And it has all sorts of like little fun features, too, that make it, I think, just good to work with. Um, and so the example that they give here is um, <laughs> it's a silly one, again. Um, but you know, specific task name where they're, they're doing some kind of salsa analysis, so we have to do a salsa robustness test. Um, and it's very clear here who was assigned what, who commented on what, what, you know, they're double checking in the last comment, you know, see the new version of the paper posted in drafts, potato chips, and the supporting code in, in this analysis, potato chips uh, folder, you know, is this what you had in mind? So it's very clear what's happening here. This is a conversation that could easily happen on Slack. The last thing that they go on about, and, and I have a feeling this is one where there's sort of room for you know, seasoned coders to disagree, but I think these rules of thumb are, are rather good. Um, code should be sort of short and purposeful. Um, functions should use local variables and be you know, parsimonious in terms of input and output. Um, functions should be ordered for linear reading that, that it's sort of in an intuitive order based on how things are actually executed in code. Names should be descriptive. Um, algebra, to the extent that you need to code things that have sort of a lot of algebraic terms in them, it's best to break them up so it's very clear what's going on. And, and this is sort of um, what we have here a little bit in, in this prior example. You know, instead of doing this, showing the different aspects that actually led to that input variable algebraically, as simple as this is. Um, being consistent, Th this can be a little troubling when you have multiple people working on, you know, different streams of code. Um, but to the extent that consistency is possible, it's a, I think, wise endeavor. Um, the more important bit, and I'm not even sure this really belongs under coding style, is testing code, um, a practice that. I think a lot of us strive to, but that end up don't implementing in practice, is writing test scripts before you write the code. That's sort of the proper way to do it. Um, it is difficult to do. Um, but uh, I can't underscore enough the, the, the importance of, of testing these things um, and making sure it's doing what you think it's doing, whether it's enumerating all the edge cases you're aware of or just trying sort of a run-in-the-mill uh, example. Um, th this last uh, point, so separate slow code from fast code, I think is especially relevant to sort of genomics research, as we've kind of talked about a little bit. Um, I always, when I run these things, I'll, um, I, you know, I told you I like babysitting sort of the various steps. I always note to myself in the documentation how long something took, even if it's in the log file. Um, I think it's good practice to be very explicit about what is slow and fast in terms of not only the code itself, but how long it takes to run. Um, so I mean, the example that I find, I, I guess not in genomics as much, but importing large data sets into state. I'll have one file that imports them, saves them in a nice DTA file format, and then it's very quick to reload those later on. So I guess before we move on to this next little phase, were there any questions about that sort of general practitioner's guide, thoughts, comments, concerns. Good. Um, so the next topic I want to talk about is one that I th is particularly relevant for genomics research and especially in leveraging the sort of computational power or computing infrastructure that you might have access to, um, and that is of parallelization. Um, and so the, the question we want to address is how can we make things go faster? Um, and the nice thing is that often the data we receive 
are in a format that lend themselves to applying this technique very straightforwardly. Now, it's not the case in the ad health data, unfortunately. The ad health data were provided, and as you're aware, um, you have two chips worth of data, but all of the SNP data for each chip is in sort of one set of files. They're not split across chromosomes already. Now, it's fortunate this is a rather small data set. Um, so even kind of the most complex analyses you might do on this aren't going to take probably more than an hour or so. And, and I spared you from some of those just for the sake of uh, I wanted to make sure. I was very risk averse in terms of anything crashing on the server with so many of you running things at once. Um, but oftentimes, for example, uh, in the UK Biobank, we receive files that are split across chromosomes already. Um, it's the case with the UK Biobank that they're actually not in um, BIM, BED, FAM format, but are in this Oxford format. So it's BGen files and sample files, but it lists basically the same information. Um, so let's say you wanted to run a GWAS on the UK Biobank on, say, 100,000 people. You've cleaned the files, et cetera, the phenotype files. Um, you could do a few things. You could run the 22 jobs in sequence, and it would take a very long time to do. Um, or if you had a server with at least 22 cores on it, you could run, you could dedicate one job to each core, and now you're saving yourselves a load of time. Um, practically speaking, the way you do this um, is to add the ampersand to the end of the command, and it'll push it to the background and dedicate itself to one of these cores. Um, and then you can use top or ps or one of these commands to kind of monitor the process. Um, but this speeds things up immensely. Um, something to note, so it, this was surprising when I first got involved in this, but actually chromosome 1 is not the biggest chromosome, it's chromosome 2. So chromosome 2 will be your kind of limiting reactant in some sense. Um, but it's important to note that chromosomes are different sizes, um, and so your limiting reactants in these analyses, what will take the longest are the, the bigger chromosomes. Um, and so actually, I just answered this first question. <laughs> um, but here's, here's a more informative question. How could you speed things up even more? Um, you have 22 files. There are 22 chromosomes. You could just submit them all in parallel. But does anybody have any thoughts how one could speed this up even more? You could imagine that the fact that you have 22 files is not static. One could manipulate that somehow. Does that give anyone any ideas? Exactly, yeah. So you could further break down the bigger files, let's say, into smaller chunks, assign them to their own cores, and now you're, you're going much faster. Um, we've calculated, and when I say we, I mean David, um, has calculated that I think we can speed up our analyses, for example, on the order of um, three times as fast by doing this in sort of the, the optimal way. Um, now, to date, we're rarely in circumstances where it's sort of, we need this GWAS stat, and stat means the difference between eight hours and 20 hours isn't quite as significant. Um, but moving forward, uh, this is something that I think we're going to spend a lot of time thinking very carefully about. We have um, Dutch colleagues, for example, who have access to a supercomputer that um, will be splitting things up into chunks that take about an hour each. And so the entire analysis will take on the order of an hour, as opposed to the give or take 20 hours that it takes to run a 100,000 person GWAS in the UK Biobank right now, given our computing resources, which you guys have had, you know, been privy to. Um, to give some sense of examples of where you might want to do this. Um, so I mentioned GWAS with, say, SNP tester Plank is one obvious one. Um, another one is QCing. Um, so actually, before I ran any analyses on UK Biobank, the first step that I, I took was, you know, we have very large files. And a lot of the SNPs in those files are either poorly imputed or have very low minor allele frequency or are SNPs that we know we're going to throw away downstream anyway. And so running a GWAS on those SNPs, it's just information that's going to be thrown out. Um, so I went and QC the data and removed uh, these, these badly imputed SNPs and these low minor allele frequency SNPs. And that was sort of the first step in the process. And that was sort of a fixed cost up front. But every subsequent GWAS one could run then 
would benefit from that, that, those smaller files. And in fact, the whole data set was about half the size after this initial QCing step. But that QCing process I parallelized across chromosomes in that particular case. It took on the order of a day, I think. Um, even Plink and doing allelic scoring or you know, polygenic score creation, um, you can parallelize. You would run it separately for each chromosome and then just have to recombine across chromosomes and, and sum and weight appropriately. Um, so it's a super powerful technique and uh, can make life a lot easier. Um, I, I wish we had more cores such that you could all experience this firsthand, um, but unfortunately given the fact that you're all sharing 40 of them, um, this is something you'll have to uh, dive into in your own time and computing resources. And so I've, I've kind of mentioned, I think, this a little bit in passing. Um, so it kind of leads one to say, why wouldn't you always parallelize everything you possibly could? Um, you're obviously restricted by the number of cores per user, as I was just speaking to. Um, you're also often restricted by shared RAM. Um, for example, a lot of these analyses will load the full files into memory. Um, and so if you're loading 22 large files into memory, that can run into some constraints. And if you start reaching your RAM limits, your entire process will come screeching to a halt. Um, splitting files can also be difficult. It's, uh, you know, when you've received split files that are 22 of them, that's, that's very straightforward. But this process of finer partitioning, um, I mean, one invites errors, but two, one needs to create a sort of database structure around it um, to maintain that. Um, so I've, you know, if the difference between uh, a version of analysis where you're just taking the input data as is and parallelizing over 22 versus splitting things up more finely and maybe dedicating a full 40 cores to it, um, if the difference in that is every time a savings of a few hours, um, but you're sure it's working in the sort of straightforward version, um, I've stuck to that for now, um, but moving forward, especially for our team, uh, this is something we're just going to have to bite the bullet on and, and, and figure out. Um, one could kind of ma imagine a, a logical extreme to this, that um, if you had sort of infinite computing resources in some sense, you could parallelize at the SNP level, right? That's sort of the logical extreme, and you know, that's, that's not possible because we don't have millions of cores. Um, but it would enable something on the order of sort of a real-time GWAS, where you click the button, you'd immediately have results across the, the gamut. Um, I don't think, I mean, obviously, I, I don't think that's, I'm hard-pressed to think of an application where immediate results versus results in an hour would be super useful. This isn't exactly Uber, um, but, um, there are means of speeding things up a lot, I think is the point. So, yeah. I mean, just some thoughts that I've had on this as I've gone through. So some programs won't allow you to parallelize, right? You will have, like, state as a single thread of programs. So you have to have multiple instances of, like, state mm -hmm. running. And the other thing, if we tie it into, like, yesterday's stuff about structural models, a lot of those models build off of information from a previous step. And so if you parallelize, you lose that information. Yeah. Right, because it's in different instances. So sometimes you're hit, you're limited in the ability to parallelize, right? No, it's a good. Slide. It's a really good point. It, it depend. It, it relies on the independence of the operations, right? right? So if um, if your operations are independent, um, it works. I mean, kind of the prototypical example. Uh, has anyone here used Spark before, for example, or Scala, or one of these sorts of things? Um, only one person raising their hand. I love Spark. It, Spark is basically like the modern way of, of um, parallelizing large-scale operations where it's sort of the hello world for Spark is having a huge encyclopedia-like um, pages on pages on pages of text and you split them by line and you, you want to propagate word counts, let's say. You want to know like the, the frequency distribution of words. And that's something that can be done extremely quickly when you split things up by line, uh, count the word distribution for each line, and then merge them <laughs> together, essentially. Um, but in the same way, uh, you know, that relies on the independence of the lines, in some sense, for getting those, those word counts. Um, 
and so it is the case here that the SNPs, you know, SNP level analyses um, are independent in some sense, you know, conditional on having the PCs calculated already. Um, and so we're able to do that. But yeah, no, good point. But it's a prerequisite. So that, that was that little part. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is things we didn't consider in problem set five. Um, I had received the data, I think, on the Thursday before the school started. So my emphasis was on getting you some fun problems that would teach you things, but didn't kind of cover everything that one could do because I needed some time to test them. But um, some things to be aware of, kind of limitations of what you all are doing or did. Um, start off with the principal components. So the principal components were calculated in the full sample, the full, you know, not only Europeans, but non-Europeans, et cetera, the full sample. If you really kind of wanted to do this controlling for the most stratification, one would want to limit the analysis and generate the PCs on the European-only sample so that those PCs reflected as much of the underlying sort of uh, population structure of Europeans as possible. And uh, you remember all that November et al. graph where you have the map of Europe and it overlays the points really evenly. I'm, I'm fairly, I'm, well, I know that that was generated. That, that kind of structure won't come out if you do the PC analysis on sort of a global a sample. Um, in fact, uh, we don't even usually have to generate these PCs ourselves. This is usually something that's given to us. Um, it, w it actually struck me as odd that Ad Health hadn't given these to us, and that's just because we, we got them at a very preliminary stage in sort of their pipeline. Um, in fact, most of the time we'll be handed the PCs and provided some guidelines to say, oh, this is what delineates sort of, you know, genetically distinct geographic origins, saying these are the, quote, genetic Europeans. Um, for example, with, with HRS, that's the case uh, for... for uh, UK Biobank, that's the case. In fact, they'll often sometimes just create a variable for you that, that does all the heavy lifting, so you know exactly whom to keep and whom not to keep. Um, the other thing that we didn't um, consider with respect to the principal components was that because the principal components were calculated separately for each chip, right, there are these two sets of samples that we had, um, you kind of technically want to explicitly include chip by PC interaction terms in the analysis. Um, I, in fact, did this later on, and it, it actually doesn't make much of a difference at all. But it's something if one were thorough, one would want to check because the, you know, the, this, these stratification terms differ by chip. Um, in terms of other kind of bigger picture things, I mean, you guys didn't implement Gremel at all, for example, in these data. Um, if you're interested in particular in trying that, that is something that I went ahead and I, I did and created the, the genetic related relationship matrix for. Um, I can walk you through that um, if people are interested. Um, but, uh, but I didn't make that part of the problem set. Um, the other thing that we did was, um, you, you, some of you have probably noticed there's this FID column um, in the data, and, and those, that's like the family identifier. And so, for example, in the GWAS, what you usually want to do, and this is a step we skipped, was only keep one individual of each, say, twin pair. You don't want to be adding um, related individuals in these things. Um, we all just ignored these family relationships, essentially, in the analyses conducted in problem set five. Again, not because that's the right thing to do, but because of the whole list of things one could do you know, there's some benefit to um, simplicity. In fact, if you, um, if you go ahead when you're calculating, for example, the polygenic score, and you drop one twin, you know, one, you only keep one member of each family, the predictive power goes up a bit. Um, the other thing that you guys didn't have any experience with um, that would have been nice probably because this is something that I think is pretty common in this sort of research is doing meta-analysis. So in particular, um, you can Google and go through the tutorial for METAL, it's called. It's sort of METAL, the meta-analysis tool. Um, one could have imagined if the SNPs had been common between the two chips that Ad Health provided, um, that we could have meta-analyzed them together and done all subsequent analyses on this meta-analyzed sample. Um, 
for example, for the GWAS. Um, the other last thing, and uh, there have been some questions, I think some people are having difficulty with this last part, trying it based on module five, um, but the heritability partitioning with LDSC, um, that was something else. So again, um, I will soon open up the floor and sort of, you know, people can work on their own things. This is something we can work through as well um, if people are interested. There are no doubt things not on this list that were not in problem set five. This is not extensive, but um, some of the things I thought that were noteworthy. So any questions, thoughts, comments, concerns? That's a good question. Um, well, um, the QC section of the most recent educational attainment paper, I think, does perhaps, I mean, this is, I'm slightly biased, but does an extremely good job of going over the, the pipeline that we used in terms of running the GWAS, um, especially in terms of, you can imagine you're, you're dealing with, you know, many, many cohorts and figuring out if all of them did the analysis correctly, as we've described, is challenging to say the least. Um, so like one technique, for example, is calculating the, the LD score correlations between the different samples. Um, but I, I would point to that resource as one. I, I'm trying to think offhand, the way that I learned a lot of this stuff, for example, was to go through all the tutorials from Plink and SNP test and you know, GCTA and Metal. Um, and so I think in between the modules I've provided, this problem set, and those tutorials, that gives a very, very broad overview and quite extensive one, in fact, of uh, how these pieces sort of fit together. Um, it depends a little bit what, you know, if, if the goal is to QC, run a GWAS, do some follow-up analysis, um, you know, it depends kind of the analyses you'd want to run. Um, but I don't know of any specific resource that's sort of, so you like genetics and here's, here's how you run the whole thing. Um, it's sort of split up by function more, I think. Other questions? I guess this is what I was supposed to put when I ask questions. Um, so I guess what we can move on to, this is, this is what I, I wanted to give you guys as much time as possible to really do. Um, a bunch of you had expressed sort of not concern, but eagerness over wanting to play with the data more and not having time to do so. Um, so I thought this was a good opportunity to do that. I, I tend to think that coding and programming is sort of like music. You can, you can only really learn it by picking up the instrument and playing. Um, so what I'd like is for the remainder of the time, when does this particular session end? I mean, 40. 40. Okay, so for, I mean, for the next you know, 20 minutes while we still have time or 15 minutes while we still have time in this session, um, and then for after the break, the session afterwards, um, try to finish problem set five. Um, I'll kind of circle the room and help people. Um, I should say I've, I've learned more and you will learn more by helping others debug their code than you will writing your own code. Um, but explore the code books that were provided by Ad Health. Um, you no doubt have thought of ideas that you want to explore on your own. Take the opportunity to do so. You have a data set in front of you that you're not going to have access to most likely again for some time, um, so dig in. Um, it would be good, and I think we're planning tomorrow to have a number of people um, present some of the preliminary ideas or thoughts that they have with this data, and so if you have these specific ideas, which you no doubt do, um, as you said yesterday, um, you, can, you should email us uh, because it would be, I think, a good opportunity to be able to present in front of the group just a few minutes, nothing very long, um, to get feedback about feasibility and um, what directions you might want to take that in. Before they dig in too much, should they, should they pre-register their analysis plan? <laughs> this is a very good point. Well, now I'm torn. Well, you certainly cannot publish results with playing with this data because you can't take it off the server and you won't have access to the server uh, for more than a couple more days. Um, but Patrick makes a very good point. 
that one wants to register analysis plans beforehand. But this is meant to be exploratory, yeah, so. Yeah, But enthusiasm. But enthusiasm. <laughs> right. I'm most enthusiastic about things I'm skeptical of, so. Well, in any case. Um, so, yeah, that is the end of uh, my slides here. So, I think um, everyone should start exploring. I'll kind of circle and people should ask me questions. That's what I'm here for.